I think we can get started. Hello, everyone. Thank you for being here in person, back again in person. It's very happy to see you all here. Last week, we were on Zoom because of a winter uh, weather complication, but now we're here, and I'm, and I'm very happy to introduce Professor Shane Underwood. Professor Shane Underwood is an associate professor at NCSU. Before that, he was at ASU in Arizona for a little bit, and he did get his PhD at NCSU. So now he's back home with me, uh, researching materials and how they interact with society to maximize resources, reduce the consumption, and all these things that we know we need as a society from, an, from our infrastructure. Professor Kelly, I think you want to say something. Yeah, I just I know usually I don't get uh, inject on this. This is a student show, but definitely I'm very very pleased that Professor Underwood with uh, with us here. I don't want to say that he is one of our rising stars in in this field, and we really appreciate him being with us today. So thank you so much. Right, I think no better introduction than that one. So I'll leave the floor to you, Professor. Thank you very much. Uh, Good afternoon. <laughs> this is the only interactive part of the show. So yeah, I, I really appreciate being invited to, to speak here today. I, this is the second time I've been at uh, the university. Uh, I came in 2017. There was a PhD workshop. Uh, this is the first time. I didn't get to speak with a lot of students then, so I'm really happy to do that today uh, and share with you a little bit of work that, that we've we've done over the years and maybe share my perspective as well uh, and talk a little bit about, about this. I am, I am sorry that I brought the snow with me, uh, but that's okay. We don't get to see very much of it in North Carolina, but it's been, at least, at least as Professor Hodge was driving me out, it's beautiful to look across this. Uh, I don't know how you guys feel. Do they, do they tell you about the winter weather here when you submit an application or, or is, that, is that the hidden truth of everything? Well, I, I uh, at the request of, of the organizers, I prepared what I think will be about a 30 minute or 35 minute talk. Uh, I tell you that up front so you can mentally prepare for having to listen to me talk for 30 to 35 minutes. Um, and I, I hope it's informative. And obviously when we get into discussions, we, we can certainly um, talk about things uh, as well. So a little bit of, I can get this to click forward. The title of the talk, Cross-Scale Investigations of Asphalt Binders and Mastics. And I'm going to talk, there we go. Uh, I've divided the talk today into really, it's listed here as three parts. Uh, parts one and two are somewhat disjointed. Um, I, I play part one as a cross-scale perspective. Uh, and I call it a cross-scale perspective to give you some context for why the work that I show in part two, which is a lot more of the technical, this is a, a student seminar, so I wanna give you some technical depth to think about uh, as well, uh, why we do that kind of work and where that work fits into larger questions that we're trying to ask, and you all are trying to ask about how do we improve our roadways? How do we improve transportation? And ultimately, how do we improve society through those actions? That we take? So part one's gonna kind of lay out a little bit of that perspective uh, to maybe give some context, Part two, we'll talk about understanding the micromechanical linkages between asphalt binder and asphalt mastic. If I say asphalt mastic, does anybody have any idea what I'm thinking about when I'm talking about? Yeah, please. Uh, is it the binder with the filler? Yeah, exactly right. So the, for those of you who maybe not didn't hear, the, the answer was, and your name was? Lama. Lama? Yes. Okay, thank you, Lama. Uh, was asphalt binder and asphalt filler, or aggregate filler. Yeah, and that's exactly right. So I'm going to talk about that that material and linkages that we've, we've looked at for those materials. And then depending on the time, I'll wrap up with a, a protracted or, a, or an eloquent closing, however we end up with, with the time, okay? All right, so let's start with part one. Part one is a cross-scale perspective on asphalt concrete behavior. Why do we talk about cross-scale? Because cross-scale is a way of thinking, in my view, about not only some of the technical work that we do, but about how it fits into larger uh, context of problems. And what does this perspective look like? Well, the perspective basically starts with the idea that roadway infrastructure problems occur through complicated cause and effect relationships that span across space or scale and time. Okay. It also goes with the idea that in order to solve those problems, 
and other emergent transportation issues that we all talk about and all think about. I know here at Illinois, you're often thinking about uh, the next generation of problems. How do we build the science now to address those? Well, to solve those problems, at least in this perspective, we believe the research must understand what those cause and effect relations look like. So what is the basis of that perspective? There are problems, those problems exist because of cause and effect relationships at different space or linked scales and occurring over different times. And that in the nature of our research endeavors, we should try to understand it because we can understand the root cause effect relationships and we have a chance of, of engineering uh, those systems in the ways that we want by leveraging those relationships. If I put that into a graphical form, this kind of picture sort of captures the idea of what I'm talking about when I talk about cross scale. And what this basically plots for us is in, in terms of uh, size and time, how we think about problems and how issues manifest uh, in our domain of essentially what is roadway infrastructure problems. Uh, we span across very short times and very short length scales when we start thinking about constituent molecular constituents of asphalt binders, and that is linked through a series of multiple steps, at least within this perspective, to whole networks. Here I've shown it for uh, the, the transportation network for the U.S. at least major rounds. And it's important in this perspective to recognize that we do have these linkages across scale, so they don't issue or they don't exist in isolation, but they're part of a larger continuum of connected and interconnected pieces all along the way. Uh, also within this perspective, we think about what are the influences? What do we need to understand our, our cause and effect relationships? What's the reason for the research? And it's a lot of different reasons. Public outcry, they want good roads. Uh, we have new technologies that emerge. We have emergent threats with respect to natural and, and uh, man-made in, in, uh, implications and climate change and those related issues. And we also have changes in freight and movements and demands and requirements of our infrastructure. All of those changes induce demand for understanding what, what is causing and what is the effect of those um, relationships in our systems across these different uh, linked scales. Let's do an exact example of how we, oh, uh, so sorry, just the, the next slide. So also within this, this kind of space time scale recognizes that we have different methods that we bring to bear in looking at these issues, but we don't bring those methods to bear just for the fact that we want to try out some natural or new viscoelastic continuum damage model or, or some advanced um, uh, subsurface condition moisture retention model for the material. We do that because we have to apply those methods at the relevant scale, but we do that in a way that leaks, hopefully, with this perspective across the scales uh, again, in both space and time. But we do recognize that there are different approaches uh, that we have to leverage uh, when we think about it. How is this powerful? Well, it's powerful, in my view, in two different ways. One, it lets us understand where those top-down influences have an impact. So let's walk through an example, a simple example, to, to kind of um, explain what, what the rationale of this. So if we start at the larger scale, we start with problems. Transportation conditions are important. Transportation networks are important conditions. I literally went to Google and I typed transportation networks suck. It's not very something I should actually say in an in a, in a environment like this, but we'll pretend we're all friends. And I, I copied the first three articles that show up, right? There's a perception. Transportation roadway networks have issues, right? And we can see those issues. We're here fundamentally because we recognize that those issues exist. Why are transportation networks in poor condition? Where they're in poor condition because pavements can fail. Pavements are engineered to fail often, uh, is a frame that a term that we use. Uh, why do pavements fail? Um, materials are not strong enough. I'm cutting 10 corners when I say materials are not strong enough. We might say materials are not good enough, right? That may be one causative factor. Uh, why are materials not good enough? Because there are compositional issues inherent with those materials. Now, if we want to understand how to use this method, well, we might ask, okay, I'll accept that there are compositional issues. Why are there compositional issues? What are the issues at play? Well, maybe it's related to binder chemistry, right? Binder chemistry may affect how, how surface energy or surface characteristics of a binder interact with an aggregate particle and lead to poor moisture damage, right? Well, there may be compositional issues because of the inherent binder rheology. Right? And if we talk about binder rheology versus chemistry, we're thinking about different length scales, again, in both space 
and time. Many, again, related to surface chemistry. What are the characteristics in the way that particles interact? So not just surface chemistry, but maybe related to thinking about particle uh, angularity, particle texture, particle characteristics. Uh, how those particles interact together. Particle, particular interactions are not a fundamental problem at scales in the neighborhood of nanometers, but they may become really, really important when we start talking about particles of a finite size, let's say, uh, coarse or, or fine aggregate particles interact in high uh, concentrations. Uh, we might start thinking about reasons that they, that they fail because vehicles interact or because systems interact, right? There are lots of pathways for uh, these systems to behave and lots of issues that drive the need to change or adjust these systems as it needs. And it's important to understand those. So I go back to the same influence and I basically add on to that this, this section. We need to understand that these systems exist across space and time. We need to understand uh, that there are factors that, that drive us to induce changes in these systems. Uh, if we look at the transportation network in the US, we've seen an increase in demand in excess of 30% over the last 20 years and an increase in supply of close to 5%, right? So these are the factors that are driving us to need to change and improve compositional and, and understanding, scientific understanding of our systems, right? So if we think about why we need to go down this path, down this kind of trail of understanding the, the causative factors, it's because we need to understand why we, we have to improve our system. But in order to understand those, those systems, we have to start moving our way up the scale. We have to start understanding these linkages between scales and or the need to bypass scales as we understand uh, the different significant mechanisms other cause and effect relationships. And this is a two-way street. There's no reason to understand cause and effect relationships if there's no need to improve the technologies, right? And so it's inherently, at least our philosophy, is it's important to understand why you need to change in order to figure out how to change and what it is that needs to be studied in the system. Okay. So again, that's just kind of a big perspective or big picture view of what do we mean by cross-scale perspective? We're talking about a perspective that acknowledges that there are drivers for need for understanding, and then there are procedures, methods, me mechanisms that have to be understood in order to deduce cause and effect relationships. And we want to make sure our research that we do tries to address one or more of these linkages or understanding of the systems. That we do. Okay, so part one is done. Part two, I want to talk about one condition where we tried to understand these linkages. Um, uh, across at least components of this scale. And I'm going to focus on the scale here between binder and mastic, right? And as it was pointed out, when we talk about mastic, what we're talking about are the asphalt binder mixed with the aggregate filler. And that's a component. That's a component of a system that ultimately takes us to mix, ultimately to pavements. And then, as you saw, I've cut it off for this slide, pavements and networks and pavements that we have. So I'm going to focus on this part with the hope that you kind of understand why we might be interested in asking some of these questions. Okay. I'm going to talk about a very, uh, couple of very specific studies that we've done on this. And, and because this is an experimental kind of discussion, I have to tell you a little bit about the materials that we used. Okay. So uh, this was a study that we actually did now probably about eight or nine years ago on the basis of, of, um, of experiment. Actually, it was part of my dissertation work. Uh, where we looked at masters. We wanted to take a step-by-step -step, uh, characteristic characterization and evaluation of these mastic systems. Uh, people in this domain have been interested in, in what we've termed mastics, binder and filler, uh, for a very long time. Uh, the first evidence of this is in the 1930s, actually the 1912s, but then there's just a mention in the 1930s uh, with a bunch of work from Richardson to try to understand how dust, he was using the word dust and binder mix. There was a whole nother host of work in the 1940s to understand that. And it's interesting because a lot of that work is still highly relevant today, right? So if you've ever interested in, in looking at this, looking at the works of Richardson's, looking at the works of uh, Rigdon, PJ Rigdon, and it was released a beautiful paper in 1948 uh, on this issue. And so when we kind of got into this, we decided to take a step back and we wanted to look systematically at what these mastics, uh, how these mastics behave. And so we created an experimental matrix where we systematically varied the content of filler 
in that material by volume and consequently by mass. Right? We did that on two different materials. So I'll label these MS 9.5 and MS 19. Uh, these two materials essentially have different, uh, the aggregate particles have different origins. They're all, they're both from North Carolina, uh, but you can see that this one is a, a nice chloride and uh, amphibolite uh, based blend. And then this is a porphyritic, uh, porphyritic kind of crab. So we have different uh, compositional factors in these materials. And then we basically just create an experimental matrix uh, up to 60% volume fraction and tested uh, these in uh, a significant amount. What do we learn? Well, if we think about trying to understand behaviors, we always often start, at least we start uh, with experiments. We observe, right? Once you observe, then you can start making some idealizations and some models and some characterizations around it. But we want to observe first and foremost. And what we observe when we look at this, and this plot, I think most of you are familiar with this. This is a classic dynamic modulus uh, master curve. These experiments were done in a dynamic shearometer uh, using standard procedures and methodologies, right? We tested uh, these mastics across temperatures and frequencies, and then combine that to create uh, these master curves where we have modulus G star versus reduced frequency. And it's pretty obvious from the titles that each one of these series has uh, different volume concentration indicated by uh, the, the, the numbers on the slide. Uh, binder here is black, and it's, you can see that going to 10%, there's not much change in the rheology. But as I add more and more dust or filler into the system, that mastic, gets, uh, the stiffness gets higher and higher and higher. And then we see actually something kind of interesting happen. So we get a fairly steady increase in the modulus. But then at about 40% filler content, we start to see some uh, characteristics that are uh, synonymous with viscoelastic solids as opposed to viscoelastic liquids. It's, it's become a little bit apparent at 40, but then when we get to 50%, Notice how the modulus takes a very rapid and, and direct increase, and then less of an increase at 55, and then by 60% filler volume. We actually have moduli values. It's not shown on this graph. that approach values very similar to what you see in asphalt mixes. It's pretty interesting. You can take filler and binder, get them to a 60% volume, by the way. This is 60% volume. Our normal asphalt mixes would be aggregate content more like 11%, 10 11%. Here, we've got it to 60% volume uh, by, by uh, concentration, and we're getting moduli values. Uh, they get similar, not, not, it's still lower, but similar to what you see in asphalt mixes. These actually, these high concentration were tested by casting uh, cylindrical specimens and then doing solid torsion uh, experiments. But we see a clear evidence of a change in characteristic behaviors at about that 50% uh, volume increase. What actually happens is that the aggregate particulate network percolates. We end up getting a rapid increase in contacts and that increases the modulus quite high at around the 40 to 50% volume. <laughs> now, what do we do with this? Well, we wanted to understand uh, how these systems behaved or what was the reason for the stiffening here and what could we do to model this, the rapid stiffening uh, here. I'm going to focus for the most part, given the time and discussions that we want to have, on what we did to try to understand what was going on at these low volumetric compositions of the mastic. Why? Because inside an asphalt mix, our volume concentrations of mastics are sort of in this 20 to 30 percent range. Okay. Now, when we did when we went to look at this, we we consulted the literature, we tried to understand what, what work has been done to model or predict the behavior of these uh, mastic systems. And there's been a ton. Uh, I'm showing you four different models on a screen, and this is a subset of about 15 different approaches that we identified, okay? And each of these solutions had some different characteristics. So we start with the loop solutions. Uh, this is actually, this equation here uh, is known as Einstein's equation. Uh, Albert Einstein's dissertation was actually on filled particulate systems. Kind of an interesting. He was actually not filled particulates. He was actually looking at, at uh, fluids and the, the use of inclusions in those fluids. Uh, we, we refer to those broadly as dilute solutions because they're only applicable to exceptionally dilute uh, solutions. Uh, we get into others like the Sheen's model. Christensen and Lowe have a generalized self consistent model, differential schemes, Mori Tanaka schemes. There are about as many dissertations on ways of modeling these systems as there are people in this room and then multiply it by two or three, right? 
So, so we've got a lot of different approaches to, to, to look at this. And, and some of these actually, uh, when we consulted them, have been done uh, here at Illinois as well. I didn't mention them here, but, but that's uh, other work that's been done. Uh, the first thing we did was we took the data that we had and we said, well, how do these models describe what we see? And I'm showing you three different versions, three different models on the screen, along with experimental data to kind of convey the basic message of those analyses. What do we see? We see that the models vary in accuracy and their ability to predict what's happening in these systems. Um, and in fact, if you look in this case, the Christensen and Lowe model, you could squint. And if you're into your PhD now by three or four years, you might convince your advisor to say, okay, this is good enough and I can, I can graduate now, right? Uh, as long as you don't run a test at 54 degrees, you probably get by with that. Right. But what we learned from this was that these closed form models can, and, and this is published actually quite a bit in the literature, can be used to predict the behavior of asphalt built systems under very, very tightly contained limitations. Most of those limitations are systems where the stiffness of the binder is relatively high. But when the modulus of the binder, the stiffness of the binder starts to decrease, like as it's getting to higher and higher temperatures, the efficacy of these models breaks down significantly. Okay. Here's one snapshot of the conclusion uh, that came from several different uh, studies to look at that. So we, we recognize that there's some kind of a rheological influence when we put filler and binder together that's not being captured in these uh, traditional uh, particular model prediction models. Okay. And why? So we, we revisited about the, the basic vision or hypotheses that underlies most of these micromechanical models. And most of these micromechanical models envision a simple two-phase system, a two-phase system that consists of aggregate and bulk asphalt. And it uses those, the properties of those two systems, the elastic modulus of the aggregate, the viscoelastic modulus of the bulk asphalt to make predictions about how those systems stiffen uh, as you change temperature. Now, the problem with these prediction models is that in a system like asphalt, where our aggregate has a significantly higher stiffness than our asphalt, even at very low temperatures, the models themselves seem to do a very poor job of capturing what's going on structurally in those systems. And they end up, and they, I'm not showing it here, but they end up creating very poor predictions as, it, as the uh, modulus of the binder system varies. It actually gets saturated by the stiffness of this aggregate. And so we don't capture uh, the temperature and frequency dependent stiffening that we observe in the experiments. So we step back and said, well, what if we have the model, this model, forget the equations, but this basic model has a fundamental flaw in it. And so we envision a different model. And, and I say we envision, this was informed by studying the literature, understanding what other folks have done and, and all of that, uh, to envision that the system is much more complicated than a simple two-phase system and may involve three or more phases where we have the, the aggregate particles. We have some in what we labeled as interface asphalt with some inherent viscoelastic properties. And we have the remaining asphalt uh, that exists in the system that has its own system, has its own properties. Okay. Very slight distinction between these two models. The only distinction being that on the right, we envision that there's some influence asphalt binder uh, at the surface of the aggregate particles. Okay. Now, this approach has been used. Uh, oftentimes, when it's used, it's adjusted to fit into this framework by, for example, effectively increasing the volume of those aggregate particles. Basically, you take the aggregate particles and you say, okay, I'm going to effectively increase their volume, assuming that this adsorbed asphalt layer, interface asphalt, has essentially the modulus of the rock. Right. We investigated that. And again, it breaks down when you start applying it across temperatures and frequencies uh, of the asphalt. Now, it turns out that this model, this uh, structured model here, actually has a solution. Uh, it was solved um, it, in the Irvine and Zawe formulation that you see on the right. I'm giving an academic talk. I have to show you an equation. Otherwise, they take away my, my uh, professorship at North Carolina State. Right? There's going to be a test later, so make sure that you write it down quickly. Uh, I show it just to, to prove that there is a essentially an analytical formulation for this idea that we have a sphere coated with, with uh, viscoelastic layers of varying 
rheological problem, right? In our model, we simplified it to say there are two layers. There's a layer that's adsorbed to the aggregate particles and one that's not adsorbed to the aggregate particles. And that was the physical mechanism. We knew from the literature that at least there was evidence of discussion dating again back to the days of Rigdon through the sharp research and so forth that, that asphalt binder tended to preferentially adsorb. And notice that I'm emphasizing the D in adsorb, not absorb. So it preferentially adsorb higher, pol higher polarity uh, molecules in the asphalt binder to the surface. Okay, that was our hypothesis. So we thought we had a reason why this, this could exist. And then we had a formulation that we could apply. The theoretical formulation allows in layers. We just simply took looked at uh, two layers in the system. Now, finding the model is one thing, but we want to be informed by physical constraints and realistic constraints. You can't just take the model. You could, but it would be a bad idea. Just take the model, fit it together, and just let the consequence of that model lie. So we had to think about physical constraints. Our our hypothesis was that we have highly polar components in the asphalt binder that will preferentially absorb to the aggregate, but those are not finite. There's a finite amount of those molecules in any given asphalt binder, and we have a finite amount of asphalt that we're adding to the system as well. So we had to impose some physical constraints. So the very first one that we had to compose was that there had to exist some maximum potential interface volume uh, and associated interface thickness. That is to say, and I'll show it in the next slide with a, a schematic, uh, that we had to recognize that physical constraints exist. I couldn't just make this film thickness any thickness I wanted. If I'm saying that it's highly polar molecules, then I need to make sure that the amount that we use is consistent with what is a typical volumetric composition of highly polar molecules in an asphalt binder. Okay. And we have to recognize that as I add more and more filler, the amount of total amount of asphalt in the system is relatively is decreasing. So my thickness is getting smaller and smaller as well. So we came up with these physical constraints that basically say that we have some film thickness. As I increase my particle concentration, the adsorbed film thickness would stay stable until I reach a point where uh, I start to reach um, the maximum saturation of that, at which point my film thickness is getting smaller and the relative amount of adsorbed binder is also decreased. Okay. I'll show it in the schematic in the next slide to kind of il illustrate this. So the point there is we have to, we can't just rely on analytical models, computational models would have the same issue. We have to think about physical constraints and what is the system we're envisioning to model. So let's look at a, an example of what I'm talking about. So if we look at volumetric composition, we have an aggregate particle, uh, and we coat it with asphalt. Now, it, depending on how far away you are and how good your eyes are, what you should see here is a blue and black hatched area of the, uh, of the system, okay? Now in this system, imagine that the blue and black hatching is on purpose. Black represents what's adsorbable to the surface. Blue represents the rest of the asphalt. And the combination of these together represents the bulk asphalt that we would experiment on in a DSR experiment. So scenario one in this kind of walkthrough that I'm gonna give you is one where the total asphalt binder is sufficient to realize full absorption potential uh, of the aggregate with an unaffected asphalt binder left over, right? So we suppose that there's not a, there's a maximum amount of absorbable material. Here in this diagram, we're gonna sit in this part of the diagram here, right? Relatively low volumetric composition. And what do we get? We have, this thickness is the maximum absorbable thickness of the binder. We've got some because this is absorbed that's been that's now softer. And then we've got bulk binder left. Now, this is just to schematically illustrate what I'm talking about. We don't envision this three layer system, right? But we do envision that some of the asphalt has been absorbed to the surface, or some of the molecules are absorbed to the surface. This is going to eventually have its own rheology. And then we've got something left over that we have kind of something in between bulk binder and pure um, lower molecular weight. If we go to a scenario two, where we have just enough binder to realize the full potential, that's this, this part right here, right at the end. Well, what we end up with is a perfect separation. This is the adsorbable component. Everything else is left over, is unadsorbed, and there's nothing of the bulk binder left, right? We've perfectly phase separated the system. 
If we go to higher concentrations, by the way, that happens at about a filler content of 25%, which is pretty close to what we normally get in asphalt mixes. If we go to less, greater than 25%, we get over here into this area. Now in this area, the maximum adsorbed content is fixed. I can't adsorb more than it than is adsorbable into the system. So that thickness becomes fixed, but because we've only got so much binder, that proportion of adsorbed binder in the entire system uh, decreases. So our interface content starts to decrease because this film, imagine this film getting progressively thinner and thinner. So again, we're recognizing and imposing physical constraints into the system. Now, when we get this adsorbed, non-absorbed adsorbed layer, we recognize that what we experiment on, what we actually go to the lab and test is this. And what might exist in the physical system in our hypothesis is this, where we've got an adsorbed layer with its own rheology, a non-adsorbed layer with its own rheology. And I can't test those systems but I can infer what the behaviors would look like. That's the, the approach that we've taken. So we do that with a series of, of models. Uh, here, what we later is an interface layer rheological model, where we basically suppose that there's one set of rheological uh, coefficients and, and expressions for an adsorbed layer, another set for a non-adsorbed layer, and collectively this composite system has to match with what we observe in the experiments of bulk asphalt. Theoretically, it would be possible to figure out what these properties are through some direct experimentation. I'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, but in the model that we developed, we had no way of directly experimenting on. So we had a hypothesis that we wanted to carry through that was at least physically commensurable uh, and, and consistent. Now, in our imposition, we supposed that this interface, uh, this adsorbed asphalt, had a modulus that was less than the bulk asphalt because we supposed that it has higher polar molecules. Therefore, it would drive to a higher modulus, but it would probably be less than the aggregate particles. Right? That, that seemed physically impossible to us. And then the non-interface system would have to be something less than the bulk asphalt, because that's going to be, again, the lower polar molecules that are being separated out of the system and therefore uh, lower uh, molecular weights and therefore lower, lower modulus. The approach that we took, the exact steps here are important in the, in the calculation for the presentation. What's important is that the approach that we, take, we took uh, was essentially one of uh, uh, error minimization. So we suppose that there's an adsorbed layer uh, with some physical limitations and some rheological constraints. We characterized a bulk system and we tried to adjust the modulus of that adsorbed layer until we reached it with a result that was commensurable with our underlying assumptions from, from the beginning. And that was essentially a trial and error process that integrated our limitations that the modules couldn't be greater than the stone, that it had to be less than the asphalt binder, and that we had a rule to combine the non-adsorbed and adsorbed binder. Here I'm simplifying it as two springs. In reality, it was a, a viscoelastic element that we could okay. We then calculate the composite modulus using that Hervé and Zowie model, we compare against the predicted modulus and see if it fits. And if it does, we're done. If it doesn't, we iterate that process. This is a method of back calculation. We're trying to infer what are the behaviors of a system on the basis of a physical model that we created in our mind, supported by an analytical model for the system uh, that we described. When we did all of that, this is what we basically found. So our inferred modulus, this is the measured modulus, by the way, this bulk asphalt. And we inferred, based on the, the error minimization approach, that our interface layer had a modulus that looks something like this. Notice that we have a temperature frequency dependent uh, model modulus of that interface layer. Meaning the other approaches that kind of tried to do this basically the same thing, idealized or hypothesized that the interface layer has a modulus that's temperature frequency independent and generally much higher than what we see. That's the essential difference there. In our characterization, we estimated that the thickness of that film was about 0.6 microns, and it had this effective uh, rheological or these rheological properties. Now, in, in point of fact, what probably exists in the system is itself a gradient of, of modulus across, right? We're effectively uh, hypothesizing what the effective modulus of, of that 
uh, 0.6 micrometer film thickness or interface zone is in the system. We use this to kind of verify and validate the model. So we characterize it at 20%. Now we then validated it across, uh, I'm showing just a few to, to illustrate a couple of, of concepts. So we see that 26%, it works pretty well. We start to see deviations at 40, much larger deviations at 50, and much larger deviations at 55%. Why? Well, our model doesn't capture the potential for particulate to particulate interaction. We're missing the structuralization phenomenon that exists in these systems. Uh, and so we have to recognize, therefore, that we have, when I put asphalt binder and aggregate together, we have two clear mechanisms. One related to how the surface rheology of the binder, our binder is changing as it's in contact with the aggregate particles, and another that's pertaining to how the particles themselves are interacting together. Now, the importance and significance of testing mastics are that they highlight, because the volume concentration of mastics in a mix are somewhere in this 20 to 20, 20 to 30% range. In fact, 26.1 is the volume filler content, content for this particular mix. So you can see it's right in this ballpark. The significance of testing mastics is that they highlight those physical chemical interactions that are occurring at the interfaces of the aggregate. That's the power of testing mastics. We can hone in on a mechanism and, and exploit and, and identify that. Now, since this time, uh, if you notice, if you go back, and if you really wanted to critique, uh, you, could, you could clearly say there are lots of issues, right? I'm making an assumption on a model that I then back calculate to fit, and I kind of get to the point that way, right? What we've been doing more recently is trying to develop experiments to validate the concept that particles, that first asphalt binder is absorbing to the surface, and that that absorption is related to the rheology of the system, built systems that we have. So we've started, or we've done in the last couple of years, an, as an experiment where uh, we created asphalt mastics at different volume concentrations, 10, 20, 40% by volume. Uh, I highlight a couple of characteristics about these systems. We, we look at rigged and voids. Rigged and voids, if you don't know what that is, it's essentially void content of a densely compacted powder. Okay, so we take the, the different fillers and we compact them with a standardized amount, and then rigged and void is the amount of void space that's in that system. Right? What it speaks to is the packing ability, the aggregate, the particle shapes, and the particle size distributions. And we got a range of materials that yielded a range of rigged and void contents. It's so-called rigged and void because of that 1948 paper I talked about. PJ rigged and developed the idea and used rigged and voids as a way of a first order uh, uh, method to differentiate powders and filters. Uh, we also get different surface areas. Why is surface area important? Because surface area affects how much total binder can absorb to the surface, right? And we get a range of those from 13.9. Uh, and This is, by the way, a very porous limestone. This was measured using uh, BET method. Uh, and so we were actually getting some internal voids uh, on the limestone, which is why that's so large, uh, all the way to uh, mica uh, and with glass and granules, different values. And then we have different surface chemistries on these systems, right? So we had a, a glass, a silica surface, granite, a real world system, a limestone, another real world system, and then mica, a, a surrogate for aluminosilicate surfaces, okay? So we create these different surfaces and you can kind of see those have different particle size distributions. And we did this host of uh, dynamic modulus tests on uh, using a TSI. At the same time, we also did a, a test for absorption. Uh, now, in this uh, test, what we essentially did uh, was to put filler into an asphalt solution of varying concentration. So we have a uh, liquid solution with, this was, I believe we were using uh, toluene uh, and ethanol coupled uh, with asphalt binder at different concentrations. Uh, we soaked the asphalt filler for a period of time. Uh, we drained off the, the uh, superpertinent from the, from the surface, and then we used this spectrophotometer uh, to try and get at concentrations of the, of the um, uh, liquid that was left after it had sat in combination with the filler for a period of time, right? And what that tells us is how much asphalt, we know how much asphalt went into the system. If we peel off and look at the, the uh, remaining liquid here after it sat for a period of time, we can also get how much asphalt is in that solution. And so the difference between what went in and what came out is the amount that's left over on the filler part and what's absorbed. 
And we can vary the concentration. And by varying the concentration, we change the amount of asphalt that's available in the system and therefore the amount that can absorb to the surface. When we look at the net result of that, and we look at the volume of adhered binder to the surface of the particles, uh, we start to see differences and differentiations uh, between these particles. Okay, we actually see two things that are relevant, relatively important. Uh, the first is a characteristically similar shape, where we get more adhered binder as I increase the concentration. We have a period of sort of a plateau, and then a period where it's increasing again. Right now, what's happening in this in this scenario? We, we hypothesized at least was that we have, as we increase the concentration, we're essentially covering more of the surface of the particles. We then reach a point where uh, we've covered the surface of the particles, and now all we're starting to do is get some uh, uh, ad adherence to the adhered layer. And then at another concentration, we suddenly get a spike after that. So imagine this creating adhered layers on a tiered layer, sort of like an onion around the aggregate surface. Okay. And we also see differentiation depending on the materials. Here, mica shows a significantly higher uh, propensity to absorb the binder. Uh, glass and granite show pretty much the similar values. Again, probably because the granite is a largely siliceous aggregate source. Uh, and then the limestone was showing a substantially higher amount of uh, adhered binder. So, so kind of somewhat inferring some of the assumptions that we were making, that we do have the ability for asphalt binder to to at least partially adhere or preferentially adhere some components uh, to the aggregate surface. Now, we tried to go at this once we had gotten the filler adhered. So after the experiment, we can, we can decant this uh, uh, concentration. We would be left with the filler particles themselves. We tried to uh, uh, extract and recover the, the adhered binder to that, but it was so strongly adhered to the asphalt, we actually had a hard time uh, uh, desorbing it from the aggregate particle. So we couldn't get enough binder to actually test the rheology. Um, and so we, we needed to go higher and we just ran out of resources to do that. Uh, but the point of that is the fact that we couldn't debond that at those adhered asphalts using standard polar solvents tells us that they're very strongly adhered. To the uh, we compare that against what, this is again indirect, but we compare that adhered volume against the rheology and you can see that they agree qualitatively uh, together, right? The more adhered binder we get, uh, the, the likely in our model tells us that means that we're gonna have a higher modulus. And we start to see that across those at least up to 20% volume fraction, uh, clear amount, uh, correlation between the stiffening of the filler uh, in the mastic and the amount of adhered binder. Those rank uh, consistently all the way across the scales. What kind of fundamental insights do we gain? Uh, from this exercise? Well, we understand that phys physical chemical factors affect the effectiveness of these asphalt mastics. Uh, that means we need to consider both physical impacts, right? What's the particle size distribution? Uh, particle size, what's the distribution of that size? What's the shape? Uh, as well as chemical characteristics like wettability, um, again, physical surface area, etc. Uh, adsorption creates complicated rheological condition at the particle binder interface. We need to think about what is my, when I put a particle in contact with the asphalt binder, what is that particle doing to preferentially absorb and phase separate in a, in a way the asphalt binder in the system? And then uh, can we measure, or did we, we show that we could measure those properties and differentiate fillers. Now we've used these basic insights uh, to look at a few different systems. I'm not gonna describe them in detail, uh, but we can apply these systems to understand wrap blending at the, at the binder interface uh, by understanding that the real, rheology of a system where I get perfect wrap blending and one in which to perfect wrap blending and one in which I get partial wrap blending or activity and, and uh, activation is radically different. And those adsorbed systems can be quite complicated. Uh, we've looked at this with active fillers, which would change again the surface chemistry, uh, comparing hydrated lime and Portland cement. Uh, in, this, in, in Arizona, which is where we did this work, uh, the state allows both hydrated lime and Portland cement and its asphalt mixes. Uh, as a mitigation for uh, moisture damage, uh, as well as aging. And so we could explain why and how those two are, are different or similar on the basis of mass content, volume content, surface area. And then we've also used this to look at uh, rubber modified systems. Rubber modified is, is essentially a version of a, of a fill, fill of a mask uh, because we have small particles in a, in a matrix of asphalt. And so we've used 
these basic concepts to describe those, and you can see the citations uh, for the references. All right, to close, and I know uh, we're, we're kind of running at the time, so I'll do this very briefly to give enough time for discussion. The message from the talk overall is solving our, our it's important, and we're all here to solve transport related issues. At some level, I think everyone in this room cares about transportation, they care about roads, and they care about trying to find ways uh, that society is less impacted by failures and, and critical uh, infrastructure issues. Our perspective is that, again, looking across scale, is it's important to understand what are those cause and effect relationships that are existing in the material. Here, I showed you one cause and effect relationship, the effect of putting filler particles in combination with asphalt vinyl. And what's happened? What's the root effect of what's going on there? It's a physical chemical interaction uh, that man manifests and change, at least in our idea, the rheology of the binder itself at the interface and that propagates. And how those change across space, scale, and time. Again, in this case, fairly small change in space and scale, uh, as well as time. Our, our basic area of interest in mastics and, and fillers are a fairly small time, right? We, we run 10 radians per second kind of test, right? High frequency, uh, moderate frequency. Okay. And again, I'll, I'll emphasize that that thought process comes by looking across space and time, right? We recognize that, that in this field, we need to change because demands on our infrastructure changes. And in order to change and improve our system, we need to understand how these components are linked through mechanisms. I showed you how we look at, uh, at uh, physical chemical surface interactions by examining these systems. Uh, you could go back down the scale and try to understand why in the binder we get certain kinds of absorption kinetics uh, to the surface. What are the compositional factors? We go up to understand particulate interactions uh, and therefore understanding how mixes behave uh, when in combination, when they're, when they're created. That's it. I don't know how you feel. Thank you. I think we have time for a couple of questions. I think we'll have to go ahead. Thank you for the presentation. No, I don't know if you answered this question at some point during the presentation or I'm, I'm probably, maybe I missed it, I'm sorry. But the slide before this one, can we go back to that? Yeah, so in this study, you were studying the, at the binder and mastic scales, right? But ultimately, when you started this presentation, you were talking about how people ultimately care about how good the road is so that, you know, they'll get their cars destroyed or whatever. But then how do you correlate the study that you did on binders and mastics from the micro any kind of behavior we're seeing on this scale is immediately transferable to no i don't think so uh, if i understand the question i would never advocate on the basis in fact this this kind of approach strongly advocates against the idea that i will be able to take here and tell you with certainty, how do I make the transportation network of North America better? What it says is, if I want to do, if I want to understand how to make this better, I better understand what are the key mechanisms and behaviors that are leading to pavements that fail or regional networks that fail, which can be caused by pavements that fail, which can be caused by mixes that fail, which can be caused because particle-particle interactions are, are incorrect or because there's different surface chemistry and interactions of the asphalt binder and the particles. And if I want to improve this, I better understand how as I change binder, it interacts with that interface so that I can target that as my investigation to, to create material or select materials to go back. I have a small follow-up with this. So would you say that it's important to run testing on different scales at the same time to kind of establish a correlation behavior yeah exactly right yep that's exactly right so you would want to run experiments here or here to try to understand that other mechanism so that uh, we can select the binder maybe we can select the materials better here understand how they interact and then ultimately design the materials that disappear i don't know if that's kind of getting at your question but uh, it was kind of a, a, I had a bit of a different idea i was wondering if you should be testing on the micro and 
scale at the same time and do that the same kind of material, same composition on the full scale payment, like to understand how it's, you know, jumping from this kind of payment. Yeah. Yes, I agree with that. Yeah, that's exactly right. You need to, to and one of the challenges that comes up with, with doing those experiments on the multiple scales that exist so that we understand the linkages, the, the arrows here, really understanding those, those connections, is that I need to make sure that what I'm testing here is actually representative of what goes into this. And that's been the rub for us uh, because I can, I can go to the lab and I can just blend in 30% mastic and I can test it. But if that's not physically representative of the mix that I'm testing, then I'm not really gaining as much information as I want. We've run into that more of an issue here on this intermediate scale, this meso scale, the fan. There are so many different ways of creating that, that material. Some are informed by, um, my opinion, good thoughts and kind of a hypothesis of how the material is structured itself. And some are just a shortcut to give some representative material. And in that case, if you're wanting to do detailed modeling and understanding the linkages, I think you're going to run into big problems. Thank you. We have a question or two. Yes, um, we have a question from Jeff. Can you yeah, uh, Shan, excellent talk and very interesting topic. It's Kamal from Ottawa, Canada, Shan. Do you hear me? I can, yeah. Hi, Kamal. Yeah. So if you could go to slide number 23. So uh, I just wanted to understand uh, how you separated the interface layer at that micro micro level of the material to do the DSR test. So yeah, we did. Yeah, Kamal, I can answer that really quickly. We we did. <laughs> that was easy. Uh, the the that's our goal in some of this work. But when we develop this, this is all as an inference to match the observed reality of the mastic itself. So we essentially back estimated the purple purple points on a temperature by frequency basis. And then the green is sort of our fit of that back up, back estimate. No, I understood your um, analytical fit, but my understanding from this graph or from your talk, you separated the interface layer of the material, and then you made a sample or specimen and, and you did the DSR test. Is that right? That is incorrect. No, no oh, we so want to do that. Right now, okay. we're simply inferring the behavior on the basis of the experiment. And, I, and we kind of question whether we can even do that at the okay. very thin interfaces because the, the material that seems to be adsorbing to the surface is so strongly adsorbed that it's actually quite challenging uh, to, to remove it from the particles. So you basically assume that behavior? It wasn't a perfect assumption. We assumed the model form. So we assumed, uh, back. Yeah, we assume that this was a model that described the physical system. We acknowledge mm -hmm. that we were unable to measure the, the red circle here, uh, at least at that stage of development. But we also acknowledge that that red circle was some combination of the bulk binder that we, that we measured, along with some analytical model for how that would be combined with the absorb, adsorbed and non-adsorbed. Okay, is there any way to validate this model or result, uh, Shen? Yeah, we, we have been. Um, it's been a matter of resources. So we started to look at that. That's what led us to sort of these observations about adsorb adhered material to the surface, adsorbed material. Um, and then we ran into the, the hiccup of trying to extract this material back off of that filler and then run the rheological experiments. And we're still working out how we might be able to do that experiment. Hmm. Right, I think okay. we have time for one more question, Anjali. Yeah. Thank yeah. you for the talk. It's, Thank you. It's always great to see you. Have it here, here now. So actually, my question was for this graph. Just it's quite interesting. So there are good inherent differences between these aggregates, but they plateau at the same point. But they what? I'm sorry. They plateau at the same concentration. Why is that? Yeah, we don't know. Just the blunt, the, the honest answer is we don't know. Um, they appear to, to plateau here, uh, you know, even though they have different uh, surface areas, 
uh, that they plateaued at that same part. We have no good explanation for that. Anyway, that, that's the honest answer uh, and no strong hypothesis why that's happening. Yeah. 